uh, advanced uh, optical corona uh, graph and advanced imaging. So uh, a lot of uh, different areas there. Uh, so he has been an educator for over 20 years. Uh, and uh, these include uh, uh, Rochester Institute of uh, Technology, University of Arizona. So you, you've been here for many years. Right? How many years you've been there in, 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 in our college? Ah, okay, so, so quite a long time. And then Orchester uh, Polytechnic Institute. Um, so after learning his BS uh, in physics at the Polytechnic Institute, um, at the Duxon University, uh, sorry about that, he pursued a MSEE, is that Master in Electrical Engineering? Mm -hmm. That's what it's saying for, okay. At Purdue University. And from there, uh, he moved with his advisor to complete his PhD at uh, John Hopkins University. Uh, so before moving to academia, he spent a postdoctoral fellowship at the uh, Naval Research Lab in, in uh, Washington, D.C. So in, and in addition to the uh, fun he, he, he gets uh, in theoretical and experimental research, uh, he also finds enjoyment in uh, photography and uh, in reading New York Times. So, okay, <laughs> that is my uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Thank you for, for coming. I'll give him some hand. Thanks, Han. Thanks for inviting me here. It's nice to be back. The last time I was on a stage in the uh, University of Arizona was uh, about three or four years ago in Centennial Hall. It was a much bigger crowd. It was for the, uh, the Chinese New Year celebration, and I was one of the MCs, so that was a lot of fun. Um, but they would have been um, bored with this. I'm glad you came because I hope you find some interest in what we're doing. Uh, uh, generally, uh, NASA and other space agencies are becoming very interested in uh, using uh, radiation pressure to control sail craft. In fact, they've been using sunlight uh, for many years. Uh, they have taken uh, account of it uh, because the uh, solar cells that the cells they use to generate electricity on these crafts are so large that they feel radiation pressure, and so they have to account for that. But uh, that being somewhat of a negative, uh, astronomers and uh, space enthusiasts are interested in actually using it for propulsion. So I'll be talking about different scales uh, where uh, radiation pressure could be used. I'll start out with some large-scale examples and move to very small-scale examples uh, throughout the talk. So this work is funded by the National Science Foundation and by uh, NASA, particularly the uh, NIAC is the uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts uh, Program that funds uh, uh, um, ideas that are 20 or 30 years out. So the kind of uh, crazy ideas uh, that uh, NASA may want to uh, develop for serious uh, missions in the future. So uh, I'm here in Rochester, uh, New York, which for those who don't know, it's uh, in up, what they call upstate New York. New York City is over here. Uh, Toronto is just across the uh, Lake Ontario here, being Lake Ontario is one of the Great Lakes. And I grew up over here on the other end of this uh, lake, this is Lake Erie here in, in Toledo, Ohio. So you might have heard recently Buffalo got a lot of snow. We, we get very little snow compared to Buffalo because we're not picking up all the moisture that collects off of Lake uh, Erie there, and some of you may have been to Niagara Falls, which is right there, so very close, about an hour away from Rochester. So Rochester is, is itself is a very interesting city. It's the home of Kodak and uh, Xerox and Bosch and Lohm. In fact, uh, the, the uh, Carlson Center for uh, Imaging Science is named after Chester F. Carlson, who was the, the, the developer of the xerography process. So you might know that in addition to uh, RIT and the great optics that's done here, there's also another very famous institution in Rochester, which is the Eastman School of Music. <laughs> okay. um, and then there's another optic school as well, the University of Rochester here. Okay. So we're all in a very nice corridor here along the Genesee River, and it's a very lovely city actually, very cultural. There's the optical sciences building here. You see we have a little bit of copper, but it's, it's glass, glass colored copper here. Must be a trend amongst optics people. Okay. So uh, a brief outline, I'll discuss cell uh, crafts um, and why they are becoming of interest uh, to, to NASA and other space agencies. Uh, for the students here, I'll give a discussion of radiation pressure and torque. I'll um, discuss uh, the differences between using sunlight and using laser propulsion for different types of missions. 
And then uh, our major contribution has been looking at the stability of optical wings, as we call them. That is, how does radiation per pressure exert a torque on objects and provide some stabilizing mechanism for controlling the attitude or the orientation of the sail crafts. And then I'll talk about actually trying to use some of these concepts to develop a next generation, uh, far future type of concept for uh, a space telescope. So uh, in 1910 and 11 time frame, NASA deployed their very first uh, sail craft, which is called NanoCell D. Uh, it was a 10 square meter uh, poly image craft that um, uh, the, the, the main objective of this was to stick this into a CubeSat. A CubeSat is just like a little like toaster sized box that you can put on uh, a rocket. And uh, rockets, as you may know, are very expensive, but there's often some spare space in them. So the CubeSat program was developed to allow cheap missions to go up that don't require a lot of space in these. So uh, it's a very, very uh, popular uh, mechanism for, for deploying small uh, 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 space uh, missions. And so uh, Nanocell D was one of those. And it went up, it deployed, um, and uh, tumbled around and they eventually fell back down to the Earth. Uh, about the same time, the Japanese put up a very successful uh, sail craft, which was called uh, Icaros. And uh, it actually uh, was, was quite innovative. It had uh, an array of, of um, liquid crystal uh, shutters on it that could be used to change the reflectivity of the sail craft so that you could do a little bit of pointing, a little bit of steering and attitude adjustment. So this is one way to adjust the torque on the sail craft. And that uh, uh, is a mission that was uh, destined for, for, for Venus. And so you may wonder, why would you have a, a, a solar sail with pressure pushing away from the sun to go to Venus? And we'll discuss why that makes a lot of sense, actually, in a little bit. OK. <laughs> All right. And some of the, of the future missions that NASA hopes to launch is uh, what's called this, the Sun Jammer. It's a uh, 38 by 38 meter sail craft here, again, with some uh, reflective uh, aluminized uh, um, polyimid. And it was scheduled to launch uh, this year, but recently it's been canceled uh, because of a variety of, of, of reasons. But I, one of the reasons is that cell crafts are really so new that there's a, a reluctance to put anything up that's going to fail. They want to make sure they understand everything completely um, about its deployment and about its attitude control um, before they, they, they send it up. So uh, an interesting thing about this was named after uh, uh, um, the name of the, the cell craft in Arthur C. Clarke's uh, science fiction novel. So they, they want to include some of his DNA on that uh, mission. So there's a whole list of different uh, possible space missions that you can do with, with uh, uh, solar sailing that you cannot do with conventional propulsion. Okay? With conventional propulsion, you pretty much stick to a Keplerian type of orbit. Okay? There's, there's uh, lo lots of missions you can do, but it's very restrictive. Whereas with, with sunlight, it actually liberates you from those constraints. And so you can do things that you wouldn't do otherwise. And so there are both near-Earth uh, type of, of missions that have been proposed. Uh, missions to the uh, inner planets, uh, missions uh, way beyond uh, the, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, the inner planets out toward uh, Jupiter, Saturn, for example, and even interstellar missions that have all been proposed and reproposed and reproposed. So there's a lot of, a lot of legacy of ideas about why it's important to go out uh, and, and start going on the adventure of solar sailing. Because you could, um, for example, the Voyager spacecrafts have been uh, flying since uh, 70s, maybe 76 or something. And um, they're reaching the, uh, the heliopause, the, the, um, the, the region just outside of where the sunlight is really affecting um, um, uh, interstellar space. And it's believed that a sailcraft could actually catch up to them in about 30 years if we, if we launch them today. So they could be quite fast. and. Uh, and they could do some good science with it. So NASA uh, is very good about uh, making roadmaps. So some of the, the highlights of the roadmaps are basically to start off, like in this time frame, of producing a 1,000 square meter type uh, solar sail demonstration. So these are large, but not as large as they eventually hope to get. And uh, in addition to the area, what's important is actually what they call the, the aerial density, the, the, uh, the mass per square area. So initially, with these polyimid cells, they're hoping to reach something in the order of 10 grams per square meter of the sail craft. OK, 
Okay. Uh, in the future, they hope to get below one gram per square meter. So the thinner, the less massive you can make these, the bigger you can make them, the faster they'll go, the more acceleration you can get. And so eventually they want to get up to like 40,000 square meters uh, of, a, of a sailcraft to go off into, um, into space and uh, do unique types of missions. So all of this is based on basically just um, light having momentum. Now, it doesn't have a lot of momentum, but uh, a, lot, a, a, a lot of a little something can add up. And so uh, the basic idea is that you have light with uh, some momentum. What does represent the momentum by k? It's really h bar times k, if you like. You have <clears throat> the momentum coming in, and for a perfect reflector, the, the momentum gets reflected, and so the impulse on the a perfect mirror here would be twice the uh, in, uh, incident momentum. Okay? And so this gives rise to, to the fact that you have this factor of two, you get twice the amount of momentum imparted than you had incident on this, gives you an efficiency of 200%, or what is called Q. Q is the efficiency factor, is uh, two or in percentage is 200%. So the amount of pressure that's exhibited on the mirror is just proportional to the intensity and divided by C. And the problem here is that C is quite large, so this uh, the, the pressure is going to be very, very small, and that's going to scale by the momentum transfer. So it's, like we said, it's a factor of about two here, so this efficiency here times the, uh, the intensity divided by the speed of light. Okay. Now, as so an acceleration, you can think of there's a pressure. Well, pressure is just force per unit area, so you can convert this, uh, the force into an acceleration by dividing the force by mass, and so you end up getting an acceleration, which is the efficiency factor times the incident uh, pressure, which is just the I over C, divided by this aerial density. Aerial density is the mass per unit area. Okay. So this is what you want to do. You want to basically decrease the aerial density so that you can get a very large acceleration on the spacecraft. And there's not much you can do with the, uh, with the intensity of light unless you get closer to the sun or you replace sunlight with laser light, for example. So for the sun at uh, the distance uh, of the Earth, we get about a little over a kilowatt per square meter. This gives rise to a pressure on a cell of uh, in, the, in, the, in the units of micronewtons per square meter. Okay? Compare this to the amount of force that your foot uh, produces uh, in your shoe, which is about 50 newtons per meter. It's an extremely small amount of pressure. Okay? This is why you need such a large cell to accumulate uh, some force over that, over that cell. So for the Sun Jammer spacecraft, uh, you end up getting a, a maximum force. If, you were, if it was oriented like this, if the, if the mirror or the sail was oriented normal to the uh, direction of the incoming light, you get about 12 millinewtons. Now, you've got to remember that this is a sustained force. It's not like a rocket where you have propulsion and you give a big thrust for a few seconds burn or a few minutes burn and then you turn it off, you lose it. This is sustained, so at the end, you can end up getting uh, quite a large velocity, more velocity than you can actually accumulate with chemical propulsion uh, in such, such, a, uh, such a spacecraft. Okay, so now the, the acceleration you get from this, this type of example here is in the order of micrometers per, per square second, okay, which might seem small, but you, you don't compare this to, to G on Earth, right? G on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared, right? You want to compare that to the gravitational uh, force of the sun, which is what you're kind of competing against. So that ends up being on the order of milli, uh, uh, millimeters per, per square second. So these two things are starting to get close to each other. So if you, can, if you can control the acceleration of your spacecraft, you can start toying on the same order as you do with gravitational attraction of the sun. And you can actually uh, uh, make, some, make some, uh, uh, some interesting missions because of that. Okay. Now, you don't always uh, orient your sailcraft perpendicular to the sun, okay? because as we'll, sh as we'll see, you really that's really the, the, the least optimal way of getting from point A to point B. Typically, you are, you're going to orient your craft at some angle, let's say, uh, a theta with respect to the sun line. So the sun light's coming in here, we call that the sun line, and the craft's normal is oriented at angle theta. So when you do this, you end up losing in two ways. One, you, the intensity of the light that hits the craft is going to be uh, smaller by a factor of cosine theta. And also, you end up getting um, another cosine theta because of the decompose the, 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 um, the decompose the k vector in terms of its normal, you end up losing there too. So the net force you end up getting on the craft is going to be reduced from what you uh, had at normal incidence by a factor of cosine squared theta. Now, there's two components of force you can think about. You can think about that the 
the sunlight's coming in this way, this is your sun line, and you have a scattering force in the same direction as the sun line. So that's given, we call that, that efficiency factor uh, Q scatter, okay? And that's given by a cosine of cube theta. And you have a perpendicular component, perpendicular to the sun line. That's, we call that the lift force, okay? And that's, that efficiency is given by two cosine squared sine theta, okay? So in order to produce this lift force, which is what you really use to navigate through the heavens, uh, you have to torque the entire sailcraft somehow, okay? So how do you end up torquing something in space? You don't get any natural torque on a, on a flat mirror here from the sun, so you have to do something to reorient your sailcraft. And that's one of the things we're interested in exploring is how can you do this just with sunlight, not with, not with mechanical means or, or other means. So that's part of the, the topic of what I'm talking about today. <clears throat> Typically, uh, on spacecraft, you have what are called reaction gyros. They can uh, uh, introduce angular momentum to, your, to your, your spacecraft to reorient it, but those things have a, a variety of problems that we want to avoid. Uh, number one being mass. You want, don't want to have any additional mass on your sailcraft because you want to get some speed. You don't want to be lugging around unneeded mass. So one way to uh, uh, reorient the sailcraft is they're called using tip vanes, and I'll show you an example of that later, which are kind of like just um, flat um, little kites on the ends, on the, uh, on the tips of your uh, solar sail that you can orient in different directions, and you end up can getting a, a torque that way. That's kind of a, a standard way, but there are more advanced concepts we'd like to, we'd like to explore. So... Um, Okay, so because of these cosines uh, uh, um, uh, factors here, you end up getting the maximum lift force in this direction, perpendicular to the direction of the, of the sun, uh, at 35 degree orientation. And then the maximum efficiency you get there is 77%. Okay, so you can't get 100% or 200% for that matter uh, in this direction. You can only get 77% ideally, and the forward scattering force is reduced by, uh, from 2 to 1.1. So what happens to, uh, to a, uh, uh, the force on a flat reflective mirror, we can show in this example here if I can get it to work. And uh, I didn't try my videos yet. So let me see if I can. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Do I still have it here? Still have it here. Okay, I'm gonna do it this way here. So as I rotate by hand, if I rotate the mirror, you can see the light coming in from the left. It gets reflected uh, off of the front face of this perfectly reflecting mirror, let's say, okay? And the force uh, vector is here. So you can see what happens to the force vector as I change the orientation of the, of the mirror. It becomes small, obviously, at normal incidence. It starts to grow, and it get, you give, give, gives rise to this cosine squared kind of dependence for the, the force vector, okay? So uh, as, you, as you rotate the, the, the mirror, you get forces always perpendicular to the, uh, the normal to the, or it, it, the direction of the normal of the mirror, but the force is varying, okay? That's the point I wanted to make here. You can stop, okay. Oh, that worked nicely, okay. Okay, so, what you get for a perfect cell is uh, this kind of uh, 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 cosine square dependence for the, the magnitude of the force. And, but what you get theoretically, uh, if you really just think about conservation of momentum, the most you can get is basically uh, given by this, just, you can just decompose the, uh, uh, the K vectors uh, uh, for a homework problem if you like. You can basically get a theoretical value that is larger. You can get a larger lift force, because the lift force is the perpendicular component here. So you can get a, a lift efficiency of as much as one Okay, but for a mirror, you end up losing because you're, you're not collecting as much area and you're spreading the, you're spreading the light over, uh, out over a, a larger area. So you end up losing with a traditional mirror. So the dis dif difference between uh, one, uh, the efficiency of one, which is the theoretical uh, uh, maximum you can get for the lift, and what you get for a mirror, 0 0.77, is appreciable. And so you'd like to find ways of, of, of extracting as much uh, momentum in that lift direction is possible for controlling uh, sailcrafts. And so that's one of the things that's an open question. Now, I promised you I'd tell you why you, you want to have this lift component of force. If you look at uh, just orbital, simple or orbital mechanics, the force on some body here uh, due to the attraction of the sun is just given by uh, gravitational, uh, standard gravitational uh, uh, 
formula, and this is, you said it's equal to the mass times the angular acceleration, v squared over, over r, where r is the distance from the sun to your orbit. Okay? So you end up getting an energy for this. The energy is, is, is negative because it's a stable bound state, okay? and it varies as one over the distance. Okay? And the distance, you can see, varies with, with the velocity. So you can see what happens if I in, increase the velocity of the sailcraft, the tangential velocity. If I increase the tangential velocity, what's going to happen? If I increase the tangential velocity, r is going to decrease. If r decreases, the magnitude of energy is going to increase, but it's a negative, so it's going to actually uh, fall deeper into your potential well. So if you increase the velocity here, this thing will orbit uh, down to a lower state. And this is what happens for, for, a, uh, for a, did I get it right? For a, um, let's say if you want to go to Venus, you want to go to Venus from Earth. The Earth is traveling, it has an orbital velocity of 30 kilometers per second. If you want to go to Venus, you have to actually increase the velocity of your sailcraft so that you can actually spiral inward a little bit. Okay, this is how it works. Or if you want to go to Mars, it's the opposite. You want to slow down the craft so that you will actually spiral outward. Okay, so that's why you want to have this trans transverse. You do not want to have the sail oriented so it's just being pushed away from the the, uh, the sun toward Mars, for example, okay, that's not going to be efficient, and that's going to give you problems when you get to Mars anyhow it's because of the Keplerian dynamics. So this is the way you, you do it, um, and uh, I can show you a little, um, little example of that, if this looks right. Okay, so this is a little YouTube video I found, and uh, let me see if I can, I'm going to, uh, oh, hello, okay. So I'm going to uh, just play a little portion of this here. This shows a, uh, a sailcraft here at the Earth, and it's going to be launched. It's going to start going around the sun here. And you can see this is a 100-kilogram mass with a 1,000 by 1,000-meter um, area here. And so where are you going? Uh, let's do it by hand. OK, so I'm going to just drag this thing here. So as it goes, oh, there it goes, OK. So as it goes, you can see what they do is they, they orient the craft um, at some angle with respect to the sun line here. And see, is it going to go? There it goes. OK. And it goes off. OK. And the velocity it picks up here, is this the one I wanted? I think this is the one I wanted here. Let me see, is there another one? Well, OK, that's going to be fine. OK, so uh, the one I want to show you here next is this one, yeah, okay. So this one, they start off the cell craft oriented in this direction here, so what's gonna happen? The sunlight hits here, reflects off, there's gonna be a force in this direction here, okay? And so what's gonna happen? It's traveling in this direction, it's gonna slow, it's going to, uh, what's it gonna do here? Okay, it starts off in this direction here, it should, slow down initially, but then they, they flip it over at this point here, like this, okay? And then what happens when it gets very close to the sun, it ends up picking up a lot of the uh, intensity of the sun and ends up just on this almost linear trajectory out away from the sun. So there's different ways you can imagine trying to orient the craft uh, for different types of orbits and how fast you want it to, to get. It turns out that this ends up with a very high velocity going out, which is pre preferable if you want to go outside to the outer solar system. You'd want to do this transit past the, the sun first be, to pick up all the high intensity you get near the sun here. So how do you orient this craft is, is again, the issue here is that you need either mechanical or uh, uh, optical means to do that. Okay. All right. So that's the idea here. So presently, in order to get from, let's say it's from Earth to Mars, uh, you end up leaving the Earth at perihelion. Uh, you, uh, you do a burn to get the velocity, your tangential velocity up so that you can get to the uh, same velocity as Mars when it's at, at its aphelion. And so what you need is a change in the tangential velocity of almost four kilometers per second there. Now the time it takes to get to Mars uh, doing this is very slow. It's like eight, eight months. And you only have an opportunity every two years or so to do it. Okay? So it's not a, if you want, you know, people at NASA really believe there's going to be a Martian economy someday. Okay? And uh, they're going to need to have regular spacecrafts going, going to Mars. If they end up with 
these types of approaches, it's going to be very, very long and unpredictable and, and, and annoying. So there has to be a faster way to get um, to Earth to Mars. There is. You don't have to necessarily do this Holman transfer. There's other transfers, but they're very expensive. And that wouldn't be good economically either. So uh, the hope is that there may be uh, um, other uh, sources of light uh, in space someday that, um, well, like this one, for example, OK? So uh, it's, it's believed that we're going to start having megawatt lasers in space, OK? Someday someone's going to put up something like that, OK? Maybe many megawatts of laser power in space. And um, rather than pointing down, OK, it would be better if we had them pointed up in a way and we could be able to do uh, some kind of space missions with them. Okay. So uh, they may be used for uh, uh, asteroid deflection and things like that someday as well. So it would be good if we had some scientific uh, experience with dealing with, with lasers in space. And there are people working uh, toward this uh, for one reason or another. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So the idea is why settle for sunlight with only um, a kilowatt per square meter when you can have megawatts per square meter potentially uh, uh, on, on a cell craft. Okay. So the questions are, what advantages might artificial light sources bring? <clears throat> With solar electric generated power, we can imagine gigawatts of power <clears throat> delivered to a cell for a limited duration of time. So we can charge up a bank of, of capacitors and batteries, and, and, and if we could only have maybe a few hours of sustained uh, power, uh, that would be enough to really give a big kick to a, a cell craft in order to, to propel it. Um, if you, if you had an uh, artificial light source, you could actually control the, uh, the, the, the orientation angle. The, the, you don't have to be dependent on the sun line anymore and the orientation of the sail with the sun. You could actually orient the laser beam uh, nor, uh, parallel with the normal to the sail and get the most efficient 200% uh, power transfer uh, or m momentum transfer, I should say, to the uh, sail craft. So it's much more efficient to do it this way as well. And so some of the ideas that we've had and other people have had is you could send hundreds of small uh, CubeSat type of, of missions to uh, uh, Earth's neighbors like Mars. Uh, they could have a very limited capacity. They could be like little kilogram scale detectors, like little cell phones that would be uh, sniffing out methane. Uh, it's believed there's methane uh, sources on Mars, and if, if there are, we could cut, uh, build colonies around them. Uh, you could have seismometers, GPS type of systems for communication, uh, all kinds of interesting things. So the basis for that kind of idea is the, is the CubeSat. The CubeSat is a, uh, a box like this. This is actually what they stuff the uh, nano cell D in uh, to uh, deploy it in space. And so you can make modules of these to put your spacecraft in. Now the problem with a laser is that even though it has a lot of power, it diffracts very quickly. Okay. Uh, here's an example of, uh, 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 let's say, a laser beam that has a, a radius of about two meters here, and the sail has a, 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 a radius of, of three meters or a diameter of six meters here. So this would be six meters across here, and this would be about four meters across the waist. And as the beam, if you, if you guys have studied laser propagation, right, Gaussian beams, it's going to, in the focus, it starts to diffract outward. Okay? So as it diffracts outward, what I'm trying to show here is that the amount of power you end up collecting across this six uh, meter diameter uh, cell is going to be quickly reduced to null. Okay? It's, it's almost negligible. So the only amount, only distance you have, if you use a laser, you only have about two diffraction lengths of distance in which to get your kick after that. It's like a candle that's almost, almost been snuffed out. You might as well turn the laser off. Okay? The, there's no appreciable power getting into your cell craft when it's out here. All the light is diffracted away. So this distance, a couple of Z zeros, is very small compared to planetary scale. So unlike solar power, which is sustained uh, over distances on the order of AUs, okay, a laser uh, is only sustained over a small fraction of that. And some people say, well, maybe you could just focus the laser beam, but uh, I won't go into it. That doesn't help uh, all that much. It, does, it's, um, it provides very little advantage. Okay. So uh, the advantages of, of using sunlight is that this shows the irradiance of, of the sunlight as a function of distance from the sun. And as you can see, obviously, it grows very strongly. Uh, it's 1 over r squared um, close to the sun and at the Earth. What I'm showing here is that uh, in order to get 1 megawatt of power onto the cell, you, 
If you deployed it near Mercury, you'd only need a 100 square meter cell. Whereas if you de deployed it uh, at Earth and you wanted one megawatt on the cell craft, you need 300 square meters on, on the cell. Okay? So there, there's this kind of, of scaling you, you get for, uh, that depends on how close you are and the size of the cell, how much power you want on it. Now for a laser, it's completely different. For laser, uh, basically the, the, uh, the acceleration you get depends on the power that you have on the cell only over these two diffraction lengths, roughly, and then after that, the acceleration, there's, there's no further acceleration. Okay, that's, that's the main idea I want to make there. Okay. Now you might think, oh, how are you ever going to get a gigawatt laser? Well, we were talking about that at lunch. How are you ever going to get a, uh, what, was, what was the power you guys are getting out of your, your single mode fiber lasers now, 10 kilowatts? Yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, we would have thought 10 kilowatts would have been cuckoo, right? And uh, well, it, it, it's, 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 uh, it's quite easy to do. Now, in fact, Jason here, how much power are you getting? 50 watts out of just out of just buying a few little things off, off, off eBay? <laughs> a few things, OK. So uh, yeah, I mean, so, so we're, on, we're well on a trajectory of getting at least megawatt class lasers in, in the next decade or so. And this shows a commercially available example of one of those systems, a 10 kilowatt single mode. Um, a laser from IPG. So people are working hard to do that. Now, having those kind of lasers on Earth are much different than having them in space. As you know, lasers get hot, you have to dump power, and you need to generate power, and so all those are issues. It's not just a matter of having a laser, it's the power source and the power uh, drain for that. But nevertheless, this shows what happens if you can imagine a 1, 10, or 100 megawatt laser system uh, as opposed to just using sunlight. So this plot shows the amount of uh, change in velocity of the sailcraft as a function of time on log scale. And uh, for, as we said, to get to Mars, for example, you need a delta V of, of almost four kilometers per second. So using sunlight, <clears throat> that, would take you, uh, that would take you about a half a year of sustained solar pressure in order to develop that kind of delta V. Whereas if you had a, <coughs> like say about 50, 50 megawatt laser, you could achieve that kind of, of acceleration, that kind of change in velocity in just a matter of hours. Okay. So uh, uh, if you can get the power, you can kick that thing up into gear, get it there in a much faster time scale. Okay. And this just shows basically how things scale with size. Obviously, the bigger the cell, uh, the more uh, power you can um, collect and it gives you some advantages of going to larger cells. On the other, side, other hand, larger cells are more massive, so you have to do a, a trade of which one you want, um, which one's going to be most advantageous to you. Okay. So that's how you accelerate and get into the planets or away from the planets. The question now is really how can you add uh, basically any momentum to your cell craft um, and uh, in order to do these missions, in order to, to do the, the reorienting of the entire sailcraft so that you can go where you want to go. That is, how do you steer it? And so uh, the simplest example, and this is one that uh, is being planned for Sun Jammer, is you put these little uh, tip vanes on them. These have little um, two or three dimensional little motors that, that uh, or change the orientation of, the, of these tip vanes, and so that a little bit of radiation pressure change on this will cause a torque which will be transferred across the entire sailcraft, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, rotate the entire thing, keep it intact, and uh, slowly change the attitude in, in, in the direction that you want uh, for your navigational purposes. So um, that's fine, but um, we uh, did a paper a few years ago back in 2011, uh, which we were asked a very simple question. Um, can you use uh, uniform light uh, incident upon let's say something that looks like a cylindrical lens, okay? And a cylindrical lens looks like an airplane wing, if you like, okay? So does light behave, uh, does, light, does light play the same role as air on this kind of, we call a cambered surface? Can there be a lift and a torque ex exerted on, uh, on uh, this kind of structure that will provide a different way of reorienting uh, 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 sailcraft in, in space? Or will this even motivate different types of things we can put in space that we can use to, uh, to control their orientation and their purposes in space? So this is the main idea. We have uniform light onto this. We call it an optical wing, 
Uh, indeed, what happens is there's a, a force in the direction of the light, which we call the scattering force. Uh, that would be in this direction, the component of force in this direction. There's a transverse force, which we call the lift force. And there's also a torque exhibited about the axis, about this axis of, uh, of, of rotation there on the craft, on the, on the wing. And so, uh, being a, a good uh, physicist, I was very interested in how do we, uh, let's, let's find the closed form solution of this so we can actually do something. Uh, but unfortunately, there is no real closed form solution for trying to understand how light ref ref reflects and refracts and produces forces on these. We have to uh, either, uh, either solve the problem ray by ray or do some wave optics analysis. And the, the, the ray approach is, is, provides certain kind of insights which, are, which are, are, are very useful. So this shows an example of a single ray coming in. It ends up refracting, reflecting, reflecting. It might undergo multiple reflections and refractions through the, the surface. And we want to add all these up. So we, each one of them produces, the, it carries its own amount of power for that ray. It sees some refractive index across the interface. It has a, uh, a refraction angle and a reflection or an incident angle and uh, it has some reflection coefficient in the boundary. And so we have to add all those up to get a net force. Each, each ray produces its own little mini force. So if you see a green arrow here, that shows the amount of force uh, exerted uh, at that, at that uh, point of the interface. There's another little force exerted from that ray there, from that ray there. So you can see some pictures with these green forces. And also to find the torque, we need to add up all the R cross Fs. The R is the direction from the center of mass to the point whatever the point is where the force is exhibited. So in this way, we can determine the forces and torques on an object. And if you really wanted to do it correctly, you'd end up going crazy trying to write all these things down. So uh, rather than uh, try to account for each ray and all the different varieties of daughter rays that it spawns and what they're doing at those interfaces, uh, you hire a smart student. And, uh, and uh, my student who worked on this, Tim Peterson, was he loved to play with Pavre. Pavre is an early CGI uh, uh, open source uh, program for doing photorealistic types of rendering of objects. And it has a very nice ray tracing component to it. So we've been using this Pavre as our way of tracing rays through these objects. And then we have some Python code which computes the forces and the torques. Now let's see if this is going to work here. OK, I think this will. So this shows a, uh, uh, one of these uh, optical um, wings. It's oriented uh, not quite at normal incidence, okay, so it's slightly uh, kilter. And what we're going to do is we're going to let the thing go. And you can see already there's a little force component here. So this arrow is going to show the force on the center of mass. And there's also going to be a little vector here that shows the direction of, of uh, it's supposed to suggest the direction of the torque. So the tor if, if it's in that direction, it means that the whole thing wants to spin around in the counterclockwise direction there. All right, so we'll let this thing go and see what happens. If you just had a, a, a you put a cylindrical lens in space in this orientation, then what happens is you see that it undergoes a change in orientation. There's a torque on it. Torque eventually is going to die out to zero, and it will get very small. It's, it's uh, uh, essentially goes to zero, and it takes this kind of trajectory. So there's a lift force. Even though the light was coming in from the left here, you can see that it had a large component of uh, of this lift force that brought it up, and it also underwent this rotation. And in this simulation, we included viscosity, so there was, uh, there was a damping effect, so the thing was oscillating back and forth here. Okay. So that's uh, kind, of, uh, kind of things that you can expect to see in the laboratory, and we have seen, seen that lab in the laboratory. And we've also uh, worked with a colleague in the University of Bristol who's done uh, wave optics analysis to show that you can do these kind of things in, in um, uh, in, 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 in the wave optics approach. So let me make sure I understand the time limitations here. My phone is off, so what time are we supposed to finish here? Excellent. Okay. 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 Good. Okay. So, so, um, so this is. Um, I, uh, I, was, I was at a meeting in Washington D.C. and the meeting ended. And I had about a half a day, so I went to the Smithsonian. Uh, Air and Space Museum, and I, I looked carefully at every plaque, every word in the Wright Brothers exhibit to try to understand what the heck they were really doing. And what, they were, what their task was basically is how do you stabilize the, uh, the, the wing, okay? Because the planes would take off and they it would crash, okay? So stability was a very important part of understanding them. So we're learning a lot about these optical wings by going back, looking at some of the literature about flight and how do you, how do you uh, characterize the wing. So one way is you want to know where the center of, of mass is and what the force is at the center of mass. 
Uh, we have uh, an orientation of the wing, which we call, with re orientation alpha with respect to the incident light, we call this the angle of attack. This is going from the uh, airplane jargon here. We have the forces uh, everywhere distributed across the wing here like this, okay? And for a pop ray code, we can do, you know, thousands of rays coming in. We actually get thousands of daughter rays generated, and uh, it's quite effective at getting uh, very good solutions that converge when we uh, have enough rays. So we can take the force, as we've been talking about, at the center of mass and uh, decompose it into a lift force and a scattering force. So you might see some things that look like this and some future uh, figures. And we can also compute the torque, the, uh, the torque on the body, as we discussed earlier. The torque on the body can also be written in terms of, once you know what the torque is, you can write it in terms of some a vector from the center of mass to what's called the center of pressure. So the center of pressure on these uh, bodies as the, as the, uh, as the wing uh, rotates and changes its orientation, the center of pressure point can go all over the place. Okay? So it's kind of an interesting point to try, to try to track and understand the stability of the wing. Okay? So we compute the center of pressure on this, the, the torque and the forces, and it gives us basically for every angle of the wing, we, we compute uh, the forces and torques, and that gives us some kind of lookup table. Okay, so this is an, is an, ex an example of the, of the lookup table we get as we change the, the, the angle of attack of the wing. Um, let's say about zero, for example, here. I'm not sure what the, uh, okay. So the black curve here shows the ray optics analysis. Okay, so we can see that the torque on the wing ends up going different kinds of oscillations. It can be negative, it can be positive. Uh, at the points where the slope is negative, that's a point of stable rotational equilibrium, okay? So that's one of the most important things we want to design around, okay? Why? Because you, if you want to fly, you want to have a stable wing, right? Okay, so this is just like what uh, the Wright brothers were, were interested in, is how do, you do, how do you find the stable points, okay? Uh, then we can look at the scattering force and the lift forces as well, these black curves. These other examples are for the uh, wave optics model, and you can see that as, as the size of the wing is small compared to the wavelength of light, you can end up getting departures from the ray optics model, but they're all, that's, that's not surprising at all. Um, we find this in, uh, time and time again in uh, um, wave and ray optics analysis. Okay. So um, we wanted to try to make this and observe the, the effect in uh, the laboratory. So what we did is we actually made just uh, rectangular pillars. These, they started off as just rectangles of, of, of a photoresist. And um, uh, we then uh, applied heat and we basically melted the rectangles so that they softened and they formed these curved structures here. Like you can see some of the small ones, they end up forming these, these little cute little shapes here. These were not really semi-cylindrical, semi so we didn't use these. We used the ones that tended to look more semi-cylindrical. We uh, used a xenon fl fluoride etch to, to cut away the uh, silicon behind them and then uh, wash them into, uh, uh, into uh, deionized water and uh, put them under a laser beam. And this shows an example of one of the wings that are in, in water here. You notice that it's moving this way. Okay, this is the... Uh, you know, a couple of things going on here. You see it's coming out of focus, okay? So the laser beam is basically coming out this way. So it's coming out of focus because there's a scattering force. This wing here is being pushed this way, but at the same time, it's being pushed to the right because of the, of the lift force. Okay. Show that a little bit there again, okay? So it's being, uh, it's being uh, illuminated out of the page here. The lift force is what's accounting for it going this direction, and the defocusing is accounting for the scattering force. And so this shows a time-lapse photography. And you can see these things go extremely quickly through the liquid at, uh, um, what is that, Mach? <laughs> OK, so of course, it's liquid. They're going to go very slowly, a couple microns per second, um, which was uh, just fine with us. Uh, uh, we didn't expect them to go, to go zipping uh, very fast. Um, um, because of the aqueous environment, okay? But it did demonstrate the first time that we saw this, this kind of uh, a phenomenon. We also saw this rocking effect. So we had a light, we had a, these rods, these semi cylindrical rods sitting on the bottom of a glass surface. We turn the laser on, the thing rocks sideways, so it's feeling this torque. So we can see the direct effects of the torque here. We turn the laser off, the thing rolls back to its uh, rotational uh, uh, stability point, okay? So that made us start thinking, gee, let's try to understand some of the physics of, of what's going on or the mechanics of what's going on. 
uh, I was never a great fan of mechanics, so I, I, I started a collaboration with a mechanical engineering professor and, and his student, which helped us uh, get the ball rolling, so to speak. Okay. And so this, uh, this shows an example of how you, know, you can imagine a, uh, one of these optical wings rocking on the surface of, uh, of a piece of glass. The light's coming from underneath here. And what happens is there's, there's actually several, several interesting things. Well, the first is gravity pulling it down, okay, through the center of mass. There's the lift force, okay, so the light's coming up this way, so the perpendicular force perpendicular to the direction of the light is the lift force, so that's that one there. There is a friction force. We're assuming that this thing keeps contact. It's not slipping on the surface. And there's also a scattering force upward, okay? And this whole thing is then rolling across the surface. So it's actually, uh, you can apply Lagrangian mechanics to, to find the equations of motion of this thing. And the most important thing is to determine what are these, these forces, these lift and scattering forces. So you can plug them in, if you like, to a, a Runge-Kata type of uh, differential equation solver to try to understand what the, uh, what the uh, mechanics will be, the optical mechanical uh, behavior of the system. So we looked at this for both a, a, um, a system with a mirror. Okay, we could look, this is just on the computer, we could look at if, this, if we near this surface or, or, or if we left the surface bare. Okay, so we looked at these different examples here. And you can see, for example, if, it's, uh, if, there's, um, if there's no mirror, no, if there is a mirror, we have a very large scattering force at the zero angle of attack, which basically means that this thing's going to feel basically an anti-gravity force, okay? The scattering force is going to be so large, we don't let it get to the point where it lifts the, the uh, wing off of the surface, but it can be, it minimizes the effect of gravity, so it's like an anti-gravity component. And, um, and then there's also this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, near, near the uh, zero angle of attack, there is this, uh, uh, almost no lift force, but as you change the angle, you get this kind of almost, almost linear uh, um, Hooke's law type of, 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 of response to lift force. And also, you can have a nonlinear uh, restoring torque or linear restoring torque, I guess, if you're very close to the angle of attack here of zero. Okay. So there's all kinds of interesting things that can take place in this system depending on, on its orientation. And so the equations of motion give a rise to basically two dominant terms. There's a radiation term and a gravity term. The interesting thing is this is the angular acceleration, so you expect this to be related to the, the torque divided by the moment of inertia. So this is the moment of inertia of the system, all this stuff down here. This is the, the, the total torque on the body, and the torque is not just the torque given by the radiation pressure. It's also the, there's a component due to the scattering force and due to the lift force as well. Okay? And the gravity force is just due to gravity as if there was no light at all. Okay. So what we can do is we can develop uh, what they call phase uh, diagrams of this, plotting the, uh, the, the orientation of the rod with respect to the angular velocity. And you see for uh, small departures from equilibrium, you get basically, it looks very much like a periodic potential. As you get further away, you get distortions. This becomes very flat because it's not, not linear anymore. And so what happens if I, if I, start, if I start my uh, rod uh, at uh, near the equilibrium point uh, and turn the laser on, it'll just rock back and forth as it would, almost, almost as it would if there was no light turned on at all. The difference is that the, 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 the rate of, of this rocking changes as a function of the, of the power um, uh, of the beam. Okay? So we got a rocking behavior there. Now, if you made the intensity of light go uh, higher above some critical value, what happens is you get this bifurcation. It's no longer a stable rotational equilibrium point. What happens is that there's these uh, two uh, equilibrium points at about 50 degrees or so, okay? So if we started the system uh, uh, rocking with a higher intensity, then what you can see basically is that it doesn't fall back down to, to the typical equilibrium position. It rocks about this uh, orientation right here, okay? So you can see there's interesting dynamics in these systems, and so, um, we thought, okay, that's, that's curious. Let's try to do an experiment. We made some uh, little wings. We put them on a, on a glass surface. And um, uh, does anybody do microfabrication here? No? You know what stiction is? Well, we couldn't overcome stiction. So we put these things on there. We shine. No matter how much laser light we shine, the thing was just didn't want to move. So we thought, mm -hmm. okay, that's going to be... Uh, and probably have to overcome the stiction forces. But at the same time, we thought, let's look at what happens if instead 
uh, we use a, a hemisphere, and we forget about a glass surface. We want to just put these out in outer space because this is the basis for uh, a space telescope that we have in mind. We'd like to have a, 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 a hemisphere like this. This flat surface could be mirrored or not mirrored, uh, probably uh, re designed to reflect an appreciable amount of light, though. And uh, it could serve as one element of a, of, of a segmented uh, uh, telescope. And now, what I mean by segments, you guys know what segmented telescopes are? Yeah, how big are the segments usually? Big as you can make them, probably, right? Okay, here I'm talking about like a millimeter scale, okay, or smaller, okay? We were thinking about having uh, basically a bucket full of, of these, these particles. We're going to throw them into space, form this cloud of these particles. And the hope is, as you'll see, that, well, well, two things. One, we can actually make images out of it, and two, we can stabilize these things enough. To stabilize them, we need to understand these mechanics. So this is the mechanics of the system. If you ever study the top, you know it's a bit of a head scratcher. Uh, you, have, uh, you have spin around the, uh, the axis of, of symmetry here. You have a precession angle. The whole thing can kind of like precess. And then you have a nutation angle, uh, which uh, causes the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, orientation of the, think about it as the top, cause the orientation of the top to actually uh, take on a, a, uh, a non-normal uh, orientation, okay? So you can write down equations of motion for this. The main thing is that this thing does look very much like a top. The radiation pressure torque is the main uh, factor involved here. And, uh, and then there's a gravity. If you compare that to uh, a top, you have a gravity term uh, here. So if we're in outer space, we just have this. So the radiation pressure torque takes the role of gravity. And so we should expect top-like behavior in this system. And this, let's see, is this gonna show? That's not gonna show here. I wonder if this one will show. Okay, I have a, I have a backup here. Let's see, is it that one? Nope, not that one. Okay, I'm not gonna waste time on it now. So, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Back to here. Okay, so what what you can expect is that the the uh, the normal this yellow curve this yellow uh, segment here corresponds to the normal of the uh, surface of this of the sphere. We don't have very good rendering of the sphere here, but imagine this kind of represents the sphere below. This is the flat surface by the red uh, demarked by the, the red lines here. Okay, so you end up getting uh, uh, nutations uh, with cusp as you uh, uh, shine light on this thing here, or you can get um, pure precessional motion where the thing just uh, is, is in some orientation and it just goes around uh, um, as, it's, uh, as, you sh as, as you expose it to light. Okay? So this is very much like a top, so we're hoping that we can take advantage of, of knowing how tops behave. And one of the interesting things about tops is that um, they're kind of like, um, like, a, like a pendulum in, in some ways, but they're spinning, and there are... Uh, certain kinds of control systems where you can stabilize these things um, into, uh, in, into uh, a narrow region of phase space. So the hope is that what we can do is take these randomly oriented spinning tops in space and we can all make them all coherently aligned. Okay, that's the goal. If we can do that, then we can, if we shine light on these things here, then we can get light concentrated onto a detector and then we can... Uh, start trying to form an image out of that. Okay. So the idea here is essentially in a very simple fashion. We got a bunch of these this swarm of mirrors out here. They're reflecting light onto this detector. And you can see the optical figure here is pretty bad, right? Okay. There's really almost nothing to speak of a, a, a optical figure. And well we probably need some degree of figure, but it turns out with modern computational photography, you can get away with a, a pretty lousy system and still reconstruct an image if you do iterative uh, deconvolution schemes. Okay. And I have an uh, experimental example of that, okay? Here we have a light, white light source. We have, uh, uh, what we've done here is we have a, a concave surface and we sprinkled glitter just from, from uh, Michaels, okay? We get some little small glitters. We uh, sprinkle it on here. This forms, this forms an image that looks like this, okay? That's a pretty lousy image, okay? We get a bunch of, I wouldn't really call them speckles at this point. We get just a bunch of, of little beamlets all reflected off of this surface here. Okay. And now if we take 
and this is basically passed through a very broad bandpass, 70 nanometer uh, bandpass filter. So this is not monochromatic in, in, by any, any means. Okay? And so if we do this, we took about 25 uh, such images. We washed off the glitter. We applied more glitter. So it's a random, every time it's, it's randomized uh, uh, um, manifestation of, of the scheme. And we applied an iterated blind deconvolution scheme. We want to see, can we get this to turn into something that looks like this. This is the, what we call the ground truth image. This is what happens if we take all the glitter off, we just use a front surface reflection on the uh, concave surface, it acts like a concave mirror, we get decent quality. Okay. So uh, we basically have to uh, collect the images, we uh, register them, we do a shift and add process, and we apply an iterated blind deconvolution scheme, and I mean, it surprises me, it probably surprises many of you that something that looks like this, if you got 25 of those, turns into something that looks like the ground truth image. And it is really quite remarkable. And so by using computational photography methods, we hope that this cloud of mirror type of telescope thing here can be controlled enough so we can get images good enough, we can apply these kinds of these kind of uh, blind deconvolution schemes to reconstruct the image. This shows just a line plot through the ground truth image here, the red, and then comparing that to a line through the recovered image, either with, uh, with uh, uh, the sequence registration or without a sequence registration, just as, as an example. But we get uh, excellent agreement about the distance between the objects, and uh, even their relative uh, uh, brightnesses are pretty good. Okay. So this is just the very first experiments we've done on this. We're going to do a lot more testing. We actually um, uh, got some data. Actually, Jennifer Barton's uh, husband uh, sent us some of uh, his backyard telescope pictures that we're going to uh, use to see if we can apply this to real astronomical images as well to give a little bit better credibility to it. Okay. So that's the basic idea, is that um, uh, crafts in space, whether they're small, millimeter size, whether they're Kilometer size uh, crafts are the wave of the future, okay, in space, okay. Radiation pressure and fork, torque affords them a, a way to actually orient them and give us some new design parameters for thinking about what kind of things we can do with these structures. We can think about solar or laser driven cell craft. I think both of them are on the table in the next 20 years uh, for sure. The optical wings, these structures that have shape, that behave like a camera surface, provide uh, a means of stability orientational stability of, of these structures, and that perhaps one of the types of examples we can, um, that we're funded to do, and we hope we can do, is to develop a, a con this concept further for a space telescope. I uh, give credit to my students who worked on this. Uh, uh, Ali Artuzio Glimpse um, has done a lot of the radiation pressure in the modeling. Uh, Dan Schuster, who's a mechanical engineering student, did some of the 3D modeling for us. Xiao Peng Peng uh, did the uh, iterated blind deconvolution experiments. And uh, Gary Ruan has helped uh, all of them with uh, optics and uh, encoding. And then we had uh, other collaborators at RIT, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, we have a, a, a funded on a NIAC program with them right now to do this, uh, this telescope. Uh, Steve Simpson at the University of Bristol, and uh, folks at Marshall Space Flight Center. Okay. Thanks. I'd be happy to answer questions. Any question? Thank you.